Welcome to day two of the Work Zone Traffic Control course. This is uh, the second module in our five part series. And Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center. I have with me my colleague, Ray Brushart, and he is going to launch back into the presentation at the spot where we left off the other day. But before we get started, I just want to let everybody know that uh, for some reason our Mentimeter isn't working right this morning. So your interactivity is definitely going to need to be through the question box. Um, I see we have one person who's already dropped me a high in there. So if you didn't find it the other day or just want to make sure you know where it's at, if you could look for it and drop me a high or hello, I'd appreciate it. And we also have for you a handout in the handout section, which is a chart that will be referenced today. So if you could download that so you'll have it available, that would be good. And we will send out the chart and a link to hopefully the recording if it's successful, plus a link to the section of slides from today's presentation once everything's completed. So what is it we should download? There's a work zone design table in the handout section. So if you could please uh, take a look at downloading that. Ray will also be showing it on his screen, but it's so you have it. So that's all I have, Ray, all yours. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Well, good morning, everybody. It's Ray Brushhart here again. We're on uh, part two of our five-part webinar series. And on my screen, you see uh, our little green flip book that's available to everybody from our Ohio LTAP Center. And uh, it's always available for download 24 7, 365 uh, from our website. And um, the handout that we have today is, is taken from this little booklet. It's on page 17. I was going to scroll down to, to page 17. As you can see, there's a lot of good information in this little booklet. But here we are at page 17. All I did or the handout was zoom in on this table you see here on the right. And uh, this table is uh, very important because it uh, some very has some very good information on there. It's got the uh, you know the top table of the three tables you see there is uh, called the recommended advanced warning sign minimum spacing. So you got your information there on how to properly space your signs on the four different types of roadway and in the middle table tells us how to properly space our cones or drums like in the taper and also the buffer space and workspace and in the downstream taper and in the bottom table gives us the uh, the proper length of a, the four different types of tapers that we have for work zones that we'll be going over today and also gives us the information of uh, how long should the buffer space be. And so we'll also be talking about the buffer space today. So, but you're, we're gonna be referring to this table several times today. So just wanna make sure that everybody knew exactly where that came from and, and uh, where to find it. So if I, if I hit the back button on my computer, You'll see that I got it directly off the Ohio LTAP web page. So if you're if you're here on the um, well, let's go back at what is this here? We have our our home page, and then to to get to that booklet, we hit our resources and programs button here on the right, which is now turned green because I'm hovering over it. So we are on the resources and programs page you scroll down until you see traffic control and work zones pocket guide so then you just click on this hyperlink here and then you would immediately be downloading it and then again here's the direct link to the ohio manual of uniform traffic control devices the omutcd so there's also a direct link there so lots of valuable resources on the LTAP webpage. Okay, so let's get back to uh, where we left off last week. 
We last talked about arrow boards as we talked about our different devices that we use in our work zones. And uh, I said that when, you, when you're going to go out and buy an arrow panel, we want to make sure that you buy one that does that's capable of all five of these different modes. So you have your arrow left, arrow right, double arrow, and then you have you have uh, two modes that are for caution. One is a straight bar for caution, and one is the four corners for caution. And you'll notice that uh, as we look at different typical applications, we're really going to get into the typical applications uh, more in depth next week, but you'll notice that you, you, you're not going to see any of them that show the straight bar. Most of them have the four corners for caution, like shoulder work that we're going to see here in a second. And in mobile operations on a two-lane road has the four corners for caution. And that is because sometimes people have used the straight bar for caution, especially on a two-lane road, and people actually mistook mistook that for uh they thought that the arrow panel had the 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 head of the arrow all the bulbs were burnt out on the head of the arrow so they just assumed that it was an arrow got, uh, instructing them to go around and uh, that was not the case it was for caution and so you know it, it, you can cause a, a crash like that on a two-lane road because obviously there's traffic coming from the other direction in that lane so that you'll see that um, they want you to use the four corners mode for that. So that that um, mistake won't happen. Okay, so here we see the caution mode, the four corners being used in a shoulder operation. And um, this is taken straight from typical application number four in that uh, in the temporary traffic control manual and the uh, little green flip book guidelines for traffic control in work zones so you'll see that um, the picture in typical application number four looks just like this and so um, i could tell the story about uh, one of the worst traffic jams in columbus history uh, happened because on I-70 one morning the uh, the contractor decided to use an arrow while they were working on the shoulder of I-70 one morning instead of the four corners mode and it was during the morning rush hour and um, all of the inbound traffic they saw that arrow and they thought that it meant that they should not use the right lane and so of course, in the morning rush hour, we need every lane available. And that's why the the contractor was instructed to not use the arrow. They were instructed to use the four corners mode. And uh, so the result was a huge traffic jam. It was right there, basically where 270 and uh, I-70 intersect. And uh, you know, there's a big merge there and everything else. And um, so there was a huge traffic jam that morning. It was ugly out there. So when you have the caution mode on there, then people, uh, that tells the motor so they can still use that right lane. Then here we have the arrow board that is uh, using the arrow mode. And in this particular case, you know, that is the correct mode because people can clearly go around this mobile operation on the left as a multi-lane roadway another device we have that we can use in our operations where we're dealing with heavy urban urban traffic especially is a portable changeable message sign and we can use this uh, in unexpected traffic situations or rerouting or sometimes just to reiterate what some of our advanced warning signs say. But of course, we have to make sure that the message is correct. And, you know, we, we can make this sign say anything we want, right? So uh, 
probably don't want it to say what you see there on the screen though. <laughs> Another device we have is a, a portable traffic signal. Uh, these come in handy on uh, busy two-lane roadways, like if we're working on a bridge, maybe we have half of a bridge closed for a couple weeks, then we can use the portable traffic signals. And so this is good for controlling traffic with both directions you need to use the same lane and uh, to stop both directions of traffic. But of course, it has to meet all the requirements of a regular traffic signal. But what's important for all of our traffic control devices is visibility. Visibility is key for both effective communication and safety. Of course, that's safety for the workers and safety for the motorists, all road users. So we have some devices that help improve the visibility. And I'm talking about things that you see on our work trucks. And these are emergency flashers, flashing strobe lights, rotating beacons, retroreflective vehicle markings. And sometimes the typical applications actually call out these as standards in, a, in different operations, like our mobile operations. Sometimes in mobile operations, these devices are the only things that provide the advance warning in certain situations. So sometimes you know, there are no signs, but we have these devices, uh, are especially the flashing strobe lights and beacons, that uh, you know, they are very high intensity LED lights that can be seen for at least a half mile away. And that is what provides the advance warning. So other, other devices that we have that can improve safety, we have some uh, fencing and cover plates. So this high visibility fencing, we use a lot in uh, like uh, central business districts where there's a lot of pedestrians or bicyclists. So this is very good for keeping those out of our work zones. We also have these steel cover plates that allow traffic to safely travel over trenches or excavations where we didn't get the work entirely done that day. When I was at the city of Columbus, we had our own um, policies with steel cover plates. If we used a steel cover plate, we would put a lip of asphalt all the way around the, the plate and, all, and bolt it down and also have a sign that says uh, steel plates ahead or even a, um, an image, the sign would have a, a picture of, a, of the steel plate and a car driving over it. Maybe you've seen that sign before. But of course, we have to make sure that the plate that we use can support the traffic load. You definitely want to warn the public about the steel plate because if you don't, you're going to get a lot of phone calls from people. They don't like to be surprised by a, a big bump like that. Pavement markings are another traffic control device. And of course, the different colors of the pavement markings have different meanings. So the white pavement markings are what we use to separate traffic flowing in the same direction or marking the edge of the pavement. And then yellow, of course, anytime you see yellow, it's a warning. So this is what we use to separate traffic flowing in opposing directions or mark the left edge of the pavement if it's a of a divided highway and one-way street. Of course, these different pavement markings are usually utilized in our longer term projects. And um, when we remove the old markings and put in the temporary ones, we need to make sure that we completely remove the existing pavement markings. So a clear path is obvious to the motorist. And so usually the plans call out for payment marking obliteration. So obliterated markings shall be unidentifiable as payment markings under day and night, wet or dry conditions. So how do we remove payment markings completely? And we usually we use sandblasting or grinding. If you do not remove the, the payment marking, what is your options? It says that overlaying existing stripes of black paint or asphalt is not permitted. 
However, removable non-reflective preformed tape is permitted. Let's see this one. So this is what happens if you paint over existing pavement markings with black paint. So we don't we don't want that. That causes driver confusion, as you can see there. Here's an example of some pavement markings that were not completely obliterated. You can still see the existing ones. So that causes driver confusion as well. So to summarize this lesson about our traffic control devices, our traffic control devices are the best way to communicate a clear message to the motorists as they approach and drive through or around our work zones, and they are extremely effective if used properly, and they help you make the work site as safe as possible. And so we definitely want you to follow the standards for uniformity. That's, and of course, those are the standards that are called out in each typical application. So, so another device that wasn't uh, talked about there is a, a safety device called an attenuator. So you'll see that in some of the typical applications, they actually show in the picture of the typical application attenuators, like in mobile work zones and things like that. And so those are, they're not usually called out as standards, they're usually called out as options. And so that means you've gone above and beyond the minimum level of safety. You're making your, when you use the options, you're making your work zone as safe as possible. So we'll definitely be get into more detail about the guidance and options as we uh, talk, uh, especially next week when we talk about the different layouts and different typical applications. So this is where we begin lesson number three, where we discuss the, the different elements of a traffic control plan. So when we talk about temporary traffic control zones, we are, we're talking about the entire section of roadway between the first advanced warning sign through the last traffic control device where traffic returns to its normal path. So here are the different elements or components of a temporary traffic control zone. First, we have our advanced warning area. Then we have the transition area where the tapers are that move traffic from one lane to another. Then we have our work area, which consists of a buffer space, and then the actual workspace, and the traffic space where all the motorists are. <clears throat> then we have our termination area, which is the, the end of the work zone, and then uh, they get back to their normal lane of traffic and back to their normal driving. So here is a, a two-lane roadway situation that uh, shows you all the different elements of the temporary traffic control zone. So you see at the bottom, we have our advanced warning area where our, our advanced warning signs are located. Like you can picture this as a flagging operation. So you've got your, your advanced warning signs, your sign series, and then you have a taper in the transition area. Then you get into your work area where you have a buffer space and then the actual workspace. And then you have the termination area where you have another another taper, that a uh, short taper that gets the motorist back into their lane. So let's first talk about the advanced warning area. Every work zone has an advanced warning area, um, even low speed closures. And uh, so it's that we're doing something to give warning to the motorists that show that tells them that we're out there working that day. So it's either a sign series, maybe it's just one sign for low speed, low volume roadways, or maybe also maybe it just might be our high intensity strobes or flashers on a on our work vehicle. If we had no advance warning, we have we run the risk of surprising the motorists as they approach us, and that might result in them uh, slamming on the brakes, going into some erratic maneuver, and then there's a crash. So 
obviously the advance warning area is very, very important. So we need to get it right. And so we need to pay attention to what is called out in our typical application for that situation and really adhere to it. So we'll, you know, what is the standard sign series for this situation? And maybe and if you know if it's higher volume or higher speeds, then we need to enhance that with uh, looking at guidance and options. If we reflect back to uh, the statistics, the work zone crash statistics that we discussed last week, you know we could probably assume, and we would be correct in assuming that a lot of the crashes happen because maybe the advanced warning area was not correct or maybe they only used the uh, the standard signage package for a high speed area which which is not correct you know they should be enhancing it with maybe some extra signs and uh, or maybe adding lights or some other way to draw attention to the the signs so one way we can cut down on work zone crashes to is to work a little harder in uh, supplying the motorist with uh, the proper advance warning. So in the in the advance warning area, of course, is our signs. So we need to talk about our signs. The size of the signs is critical. So the manual tells us that due to importance of higher speed locations those signs shall be 48 inches by 48 inches. So if you're driving on I-71, for instance, and we've got a right lane closure, those signs that you see in the advanced warning area are 48 by 48. And then where speeds and volumes are lower than that, like usually a lot of the local agencies' roadways, like cities and villages and uh, county engineers and townships, these signs can be 36 by 36 inches in size. And of course, if on our secondary roads or streets where we're, maybe we're dealing with 25 mile per hour situations, you might, you can con consider 24 by 24. But if I was you, you know, at, working at a local government agency, I would use the 36 by 36, even in those situations. So here's a table that reiterates what that previous slide says about the size of our speeds. So let's take a look at some typical applications and um, or different situations that, that take that show us the uh, advanced warning area with the signs. So in this picture, we have a four lane divided roadway and it's showing you two different situations. On the, the one on the left is long-term or intermediate term roadway projects. And then on the right is short term. But the main point of this slide is that if you have a four lane divided roadway, then you need your signs to be on both sides of the road. So there's a good picture of it on the right from the field. So uh, you can probably figure out why we need the signs on both sides, but mainly, you know, a four lane divided highway is built because it needs to carry a lot of traffic. And so this includes commercial traffic. So 18 wheelers and there have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of 18 wheelers if you're driving on i-70 for instance between columbus and springfield you'll you'll see lots and lots of 18 wheelers and if they're all in the right lane and you're in the left lane then you may not even see the um, signs on the on the right side of the road so that's a an important reason to have the those signs on both sides of the road then here's a situation on a two-lane roadway. A flagging operation calls out uh, a sign series of a, at least three signs. And so in this situation, we only need them to be on the right side of the road. 
So in the advanced warning area, <clears throat> you know, we're going to have to give special consideration for different things like um, maybe it's high speed highways or site distance issues like for curves and hills, dips in the road, intersections, driveways, you know, at the in the in cities and villages, you know, we have lots of roads that have driveways that are located closely together. You'll have on-street parking that could uh, block signs. Sometimes uh, in cities and villages, we need to remove parking the day that we're out there working on the roads. And then we have commercial signs that are going that are already there and other existing signs that we have to think about to, as we place our road work signs out there, we want to make sure they stand out to the motorists. So sometimes it's not so easy to figure out where to put our signs. Here's a situation where, um, as we can see, maybe it's a busy driveway or maybe it's a street intersection, but every time a motorist approaches the stop sign, for instance, they're going to block the view of the sign for the, the motorists that are on that roadway. So, may, so in this situation, that is not a good place to put that sign. Maybe it should have been uh, before the intersection a little ways. We also want to make sure that we don't put it in a situation, in a place where the motorist is trying to pull out. It's not blocking the view of that motorist as it's trying to make a left turn out. Here's a situation where we see the advance warning signs in different places. They're competing with other signs out there, but there's also uh, like the first sign, it's, it's on the sidewalk. And uh, we don't usually want the road work sign on the sidewalk. It's, um, you know, it's interfering with the pedestrians. So that's not good. And then the second sign we see is about 10 feet up in the air. So we can probably think of better places to put these signs, can't we? So I know when I was at the city of Columbus, we would actually, if we were in the downtown area, we would actually strap our signs to the drums, the orange barrels, and in a way that so the, the bottom of the sign is at least a foot off of the traveled way. And we would uh, remove parking and put those, um, the drums in the parking area. So that was our, our way of uh, dealing with a situation like this. <clears throat> and here's uh, an obvious situation where the, the road work sign is being blocked by permanent signs. I think um, the person who placed this sign could have done a better job, don't you, of, uh, of moving it further away from the permanent signs. And then we have a picture here of a, it's a cluster of work zone signs with a permanent sign. So the uh, road work signs really do not stand out here and you can't really even read the entire sign of that first orange sign. So maybe they should have uh, th put some more thought into where that sign should have been, maybe a little further away from the yellow sign or Maybe they could have used the portable signs and placed those on both sides of the road, something like that. You really want to um, always think about putting yourself into the driver's seat of the motoring public and ask yourself, uh, does, can you really read that sign? If not, then uh, consider a different location. So these, uh, So that's the advanced warning sign. I know that uh, if there's anybody in class today from the from a county engineers or township, you can you probably have problems sometimes figuring out where to put your signs on the on our rural two lane roads. You know, some, in Ohio we have situations where the there isn't much of a shoulder or no shoulder at all. Maybe there's a, a steep ditch alongside the road with no shoulder or situations where uh, the brush
brush or vegetation is uh, pretty close to the road. So sometimes on our narrow two-lane roads, we actually see signs on the other side of the road. Uh, if that works out, you know, that's something to think about in those situations. Or maybe maybe the, the crew has to do some work in, uh, in clearing some brush before they uh, get out there with the signs that day. And so if you're you're block if you're blocking a lane of traffic while you're placing the signs, then you know that's a safety hazard. You got to think about that. So if you're in the lane of travel on those two lane rural roads as you're placing the signs, you're actually a mobile operation at that point. So you really have to follow typical application number 17 in that booklet uh, in order to let the motorists know that you're in their lane of travel. So that's very important. Okay, so let's also, let's move on to our next element in our work zone, which is the transition area. I think I see some questions. Does he have a question there, Victoria? Ray, there were some questions that came in earlier about Mentimeter, and I had let folks know that um, we aren't using it because it wasn't working this morning for some reason. So um, we'll okay. just be asking questions of them. You will be, and they can respond back to the question box, and I'll read those off. All right. Okay, so the transition area, that's where we're moving traffic from one lane to another. Or maybe we're dealing with a shoulder taper or something like that. And so there's five different tapers um, with our in our transition area for different situations. So let's uh, see what I'm talking about here. So we have our, our different tapers. We have our the upstream tapers, which are the most important. So we've got merging tapers. We have shifting tapers, shoulder tapers, two-way traffic tapers, which is the fancy name for the taper in a flagging operation on a two-lane road. And then we have our downstream taper. So that's where the termination area is. And so each one of these different types of tapers has uh, different specifications. So anytime we're on a multi-lane road, a four-lane road, for instance, we're closing a lane, we're going to be using a merging taper. And uh, so where traffic is gradually moved from its normal travel lane to another lane, and it's usually marked by channelizing devices and or pavement markings or both. So here we have a four-lane road, a picture of a four-lane road at the bottom. And so as you can see, we're closing the uh, we'll call it the westbound right lane in the situation and so we, uh, we will be using a merging taper here and the length of this taper depends on the speed of traffic and the width of the closed lane I used to this slide used to have some good animation it would show the uh, the orange car and the green car they're both they're on a four lane undivided roadway as they approach the taper. You know, it shows how the orange car has to jockey over. So uh, it's usually a high speed situation. So it's a very long merging taper. So in order to um, allow the driver of the orange car to figure out what his maneuver is, is he going to do his best to get in front of the green car, or does he drive safer and defensively and take his place behind the green car? I think we've all been in this situation before. Um, sometimes there's a problem if you got two aggressive drivers, right? But that just gives us more reason to provide, you know, the proper length of this merging taper and uh, the advance warning the proper advance warning and before that merging taper as well. And in this situation, we'd, we'd want an, an arrow panel as, as well. So let's uh, take a look at uh, how we determine the length of a merging taper. And so it depends on the speed of traffic 
and the width of the lane. Of course, on a four-lane highway, it's most likely, you know, high-speed 55 to 65 or 70 mile per hour roadway. It's going to be a 12-foot wide lane. But then at the local government level, you know, we have a lot of 35 mile per hour four lane or five lane arterial roadways. They aren't necessarily 12 foot wide, they're 11 feet or 10 feet. In downtown Columbus, we have some lanes that are nine feet. I think a couple of turn lanes are like eight and a half feet. You know, you can get by with that in certain situations with low speed. And maybe it's a turn lane that usually is not utilized by uh, big trucks, for instance. So I'm sure everybody's uh, favorite class in high school was algebra, right? So everybody loves algebra, right? It's where you get to use letters instead of numbers, right? How fun is that? But uh, here we have a, an algebraic formula, L equals WS. So that means that the length of the taper in feet is equal to the width of the lane in feet times the speed of traffic in miles per hour. So for high speed, it's L equals WS. So if we're working in a high speed lane closure, first of all, what is high speed? At ODOT, we use 45 miles per hour or higher as a, as a high speed roadway. Um, that's not necessarily a fixed number, maybe subjective. I know that um, when I was at the city of Columbus, we actually had some roadways that are 40 miles per hour. Some of those were two lane roads, but maybe you'll be shocked by this, but it was found out that some motorists out there were actually driving faster than 40 miles per hour on those roads. Isn't that shocking? So if we were setting up a flagging operation on like Agler Road, which at the time, uh, or Sunbury Road, where it's two lane, uh, we would actually use, instead of low speed specifications, we would uh, go above and beyond that, use some higher speed to enhance the safety so we could deal with the, the higher speed traffic, the, the speeders out there. So it says, if you're in doubt, assume the facility is high speed. So when we're out there working in a lane closure, which of course is a common work zone traffic control situation, we have to realize that we're in a, uh, a situation that has the potential to create crashes or congested conditions. And of course, congested conditions are, that's where a lot of crashes happen. <clears throat> so, we want to follow the correct procedures. That's critical, even for low speeds. And we, you know, we want to think about, you know, not just looking at the standards in a typical application, but think about enhancing the safety by utilizing things that are mentioned in the guidance and options portion of the typical application. <clears throat> so here's a chart. If you don't work for ODOT, maybe you work for a local government agency, you prefer this table over the one uh, that's in the um, in the handout because the handout assumes a 12-foot lane. Here we actually have it broken down from 9-foot to 12-foot in width. So if you're working in a 35-mile-per-hour situation with a 10-foot lane on a on a multi-lane roadway, you can see that, uh, let's look it up here. So we have 35 miles per hour, if you can see my arrow circling the 35, and we go over here to 10 feet, then that merging taper needs to be 205 feet long minimum. You know, a 12-foot lane would be 245 feet. So there's a substantial difference there. But if we're working on an ODOT project on I-71, we would see that the merging taper needs to be a minimum of 780 feet long. So pretty big difference there between high speed and low speed, isn't it? Here's a picture of a merging taper in the field down in uh, District 9. 
I don't know what highway that would be. Maybe that's US 35 or maybe it's Route 23. That's probably 35 at some point. So then we have our low speed situations, 40 miles per hour or less. And you can see our algebraic formula becomes more complicated. We have L equals WS squared over 60. So, okay, maybe not everybody got straight A's in algebra. So that's okay, though, because we have these tables that, where we've already done the math for you. So what is low speed? So at O dot, we use 40 miles per hour or less. So what are some examples of low speed roads? So we have our urban residential streets, suburban residential streets. So urban is like the maybe the near east side of Columbus. There's a lot of residential streets over there. Suburban residential streets. We have our, you know, residential streets like up in Dublin or Westerville. We have our low speed arterials. You know, a lot of uh, cities and villages have their low speed arterial streets. Um, what would be some of those? Let's see. Well, I mentioned some like Sunbury or uh, where else? Some portions of Morse Road um, are dipped down to low speed. High Street uh, definitely has some uh, low speed areas. Most of High Street is probably low speed until you get up um, north of Worthington. And then we have streets within a central business district. So you can think of like downtown Columbus and other cities where they have the 25 mile per hour streets in the downtown area where they have um, not just the streets, but alleys and lots of pedestrians and things like that. So here we have uh, the table that uh, breaks down the, the low speeds and the different widths of lanes. So if you're in a a 25 mile per hour situation on a multi-lane road with a 10 foot wide lane you could uh, get by with a, a 105 foot merging taper versus 125 at 12 feet and of course we have our 35 foot roadway which is a uh, a lot of villages and cities have 35 mile per hour streets so there's your numbers for emerging taper and anytime we're closing a lane on a multi-lane roadways, we, we like to use arrow panels and uh, the typical applications call for the use of arrow panels in these situations. So we use our arrow panels to direct traffic into the proper lane. And the arrow panel is positioned on the shoulder at the beginning of the merging taper or inside the taper if the shoulder is too narrow or maybe there is no shoulder. So a lot of our multi-lane state routes definitely have shoulders, but then our multi-lane roadways at the, in cities and villages, a lot of them don't have shoulders. Like they're, they're curbed, they have curbed under streets. So the, in those situations, we put the arrow panel inside the merging taper. And we never use an arrow board to direct traffic into opposing lanes. So that means that we we don't use arrow boards on two lane roads while we're flagging. So here's a the preferred location on a multi-lane road on the on the shoulder and we're also protecting the arrow panel with a shoulder taper. And the shoulder taper is one third the length of the merging taper. The secondary location, when the, no shoulder is present, it's, a, it's to place the arrow panel inside the merging taper, as you can see here. Then we have multiple tapers. Sometimes we need to close more than one lane. And in those situations, we don't want you to place one really long merging taper. We're gonna close each lane separately, having its own merging taper and then have a tangent section or straight section in between those tapers. So 
here's a multi-lane major highway all these lanes are going in one direction we're closing the right both the the, the two rightmost lanes in this situation and we'll see that each of those lanes has its own merging taper followed by a tangent section and it says here that um, in this situation the tangent section is equal to twice the length of the merging taper and then we have our second merging taper we also see the placement of the arrow panels uh, for each merging taper And so each one is separated by a minimum of 2L. So that's if we're closing three lanes on that major highway. And here, here we are, the uh, if we throw in the actual speeds and we do the math, we'll, we'll see that uh, in, on a freeway where the width of lanes is 12 feet, we have the uh, the speed is 65 miles per hour. If we look at our table, we would see that the length of each taper is 780 feet. So twice that, the the, so the length of the tangent sections would be 1,560 feet. We could also do the math for the for the um, for a 35 mile per hour situation. So if we look at our table then the length of the taper would be 245 feet. And then the, so twice that would be 490 feet. So here's an example using a, a typical four lane undivided roadway where we're closing down half the road. So if it's a north south roadway, we wanna close both northbound lanes. <clears throat> This is actually following typical application number 32, but we'll see we're, we're first closing the rightmost lane with a merging taper. And then we have a different type of taper for where we close the left northbound lane. It's called a shifting taper. And you'll see on the right, we have these arrows are called shifting arrows. So we shift the traffic over a lane. And then when we get past the work area, we're shifting them back and so the length of a shift shifting taper is different so let's uh, see what that, that's talking about here so um, different speeds have different requirements for shifting tapers it's either half l or l depending on the speed and so here they're using freeway speeds, but you can also look at your tables down at the, the bottom table of those three on your handout and uh, look under shifting taper for uh, 35 mile per hour, for instance. So anytime that we're, we're out there, we're closing lanes of traffic, you know, we definitely need to follow the fundamentals. And when I say that, I'm talking about the fundamentals of visibility, warning, and control. So visibility means that all of our devices are visible to the motoring public. So those are our, you know, we talked about signs, we talked about our channelizing devices, and of course our other devices that we've talked about, aero panels, things like that. We need to have the uh, the proper warning, so that's the advance warning. We need to make sure that our signs are placed correctly according to the typical application. And also have the proper traffic control. So that means so everyone can maneuver around the site um, safely and there, there's no confusion. So as we get familiar with the OMUTCD part six, does everybody remember what OMUTCD stands for? It stands for the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And last week we learned that there are nine parts to the manual, but part six is called the Temporary Traffic Control Manual. 
So inside part six, you'll see that there are several typical applications. I think there's 46 different typical applications related to high speed and low speed lane closures. And as we look at each of these typical applications, you know, I talked about there's a, there's a picture of the situation and then there's a notes page that uh, has a lot of information. It contains the standards and guidance and options. And so the thing about these typical applications, of course, since the book is published, the manual is published by ODOT, it, all these different typical applications look like state routes. And so they're, they're really ideal situations, ideal conditions where, you know, if you work for a village or a city, you know what I'm talking about, you know, there's a, we talked about different things like, you know, lots of driveways or um, site distance restrictions and things like that, that you don't necessarily see uh, on state routes. So we need to be able to adjust these typical applications to reflect the actual field conditions. So if we're on a short duration lane closure, um, this is where the situation is. The road crew is going to be out there for up to one hour. So you're there for an hour or less. But even though you're out there for a shorter amount of time, you still have the same dangers as a long-term project. So in these situations, you you, you know you might you might want to consider adding additional devices. Like if you're in an urban situation you want to think about a changeable message board or a shadow vehicle equipped with a truck mounted attenuator if it's a, a mobile operation so what it's saying is don't just go out there with the standards uh, that are mentioned in the typical application what these are are things that are discussed in the options of the typical application so we're looking to enhance the safety So let's take a look here at a four lane undivided roadway. And in this typical application, which is number 30, they're closing both interior lanes. So you got the northbound left lane and the southbound left lane closed. And so um, it's, it's, the picture is showing us the, the minimum standards here for uh, for the signage, it's showing us two signs to have in our advanced warning area. So that's a, you know, this is the minimum standards. You got road work ahead sign followed by left lane closed ahead sign. You know, we can enhance that with a third sign that shows the symbol of the left lane merging over into the right. Then it's showing a merging taper at length L. And it shows the placement of the buffer space and it shows the actual work area. So you could, you know, you can just use half of this. If you're only in the in the northbound left lane, for instance, then you you know just don't use what's shown there in the southbound left lane. So you can use this to help guide you through uh, installing a northbound left lane closure only. But if you're using if you are closing both interior lanes and you see the southbound signage and uh, placement of the taper and arrow board as well and the buffer space. And then here's typical application number 32 that shows a four lane undivided roadway where both northbound lanes are being closed. And so as you can see that it's a combination of a, a merging taper that's Close in the northbound right lane, then we have our tangent area, and then we have our shifting taper. And so, and you can see the signage package there too. How many signs do we have here? We've got four different signs in the advance warning area. So we have a road work ahead sign followed by right lane closed ahead. Then they've repeated the right lane closed ahead, and then the merging symbol sign of the right lane merging over. Then we have our arrow panel. 
And then when we get beyond that, we have the shifting arrow signs. Shift them to the left and then shift them back to the right. And then we have our end roadwork sign. Then we have the southbound aspect of this application. So we have to uh, let the southbound motorist, motorist know that their southbound left lane has been closed. So we have the advanced warning signs for that situation, which is the road work ahead, followed by a left lane closed ahead. And they put in another left lane closed ahead sign and then the merging symbol sign showing the left lane uh, moving over. Then there's the arrow panel inside the buffer space for that area, or the, basically the end of the merging taper right before the buffer space. We don't need any shifting taper sign on the southbound because they're not shifting. They're just moving over one lane in that in the southbound traffic. So if you have to close down half the road, then that would be this would be the typical application to follow. And another note, when we're on a multi-lane roadway, we, we don't want you to use flaggers out there. We're going to close the lanes using traffic control devices only. Here we have a picture of, uh, might be a few things wrong in this picture. Let's see. I'm pretty sure this picture was not taken last week, right? So it's got some older vehicles and things yeah. like that in there. <laughs> Do you want people to tell you on the yeah. question box what they think is wrong? Yeah, there's probably more than one thing wrong. So there's probably multiple answers. So. What sort of things do you see here that we've talked about already? Um, who can find Checking at least? Checking to see who's still awake out there. Type who, it in the question box and I'll read it off to Ray. The barrel is upside down, not standard barrels, damaged barrels, pavement markings. Another person caught that the barrel was upside down. Damaged cones, no amber marker, warning lights, wrong colored pavement markings. Another upside down barrel. How's that, Ray? That sounds good. Let's see if I click Advanced on this. Warning. Did not obliterate markings. All pavement markings are present. That's right. Well, let's see. Oh, somebody said the barrel's in the middle of the lane where the traffic's supposed to go. Yep. No weights to hold drums down. So we definitely yeah. have an upside down drum. What else do we have? Payment marking not completely removed. That might cause confusion. A drum with a distorted shape. That's right. We need our drums to, to be recognized with their shape. I think another one was, you know, workers' vehicles, using their personal vehicles parked in the work zone. That might not be good either. So a little more about the shifting taper. Is this where we use, we, um, we use these to shift traffic laterally into another lane or a shoulder, especially a lane that usually has traffic going the opposite direction. That's the key part of the shifting taper or a shoulder we can use we can use this you know the shorter taper when we're dealing with the shoulder because there's usually not traffic on there so we have different lengths of a of the shifting taper based upon the speed of traffic if it's 50 miles per hour or greater we use the we use l which is the length of a merging taper and if it's less than 50 miles per hour we use half l so in lower speed situations, we can use half the length of a merging taper. So you probably saw this situation a lot last year, but we're still continuing it this year. Like on our interstates, ODOT is beefing up our shoulders. Maybe you noticed that. And uh, we're doing that 
so that we can use shoulders in emergency situations to carry traffic, even the, even trucks. And so maybe you saw this exact work zone setup as we're beefing up the shoulder on the left part of a divided highway. Um, we use the shifting taper and then we, we move people over onto the shoulder so we didn't lose any lanes. We still had all the capacity. We didn't have to close the lane and lose capacity of the roadway. So if you watch, we have some animation here of how all three vehicles stay in their own lane. So this is, um, so we have, you know, a lot of like on 270 where we have three lanes approaching the, the traffic and three lanes still go through the work zone. All right. So this is kind of like what you saw out there. Here we have, a, this is two lanes before the work zone and two lanes through the work zone because we're actually using the shoulder. Another type of taper we have is the shoulder taper. This is typical, app. we use this on typical application number four, and then here we have typical application number six. Number four is titled shoulder work. Number six is titled shoulder work with minor encroachment. So in this one, uh, the work crew is doing work on the shoulder, but they're actually encroaching on the through lane by a foot or two but not enough to actually close the lane of traffic. And um, when I say that, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how far can I go out into that lane before I actually have to close that lane? Well, this, this typical application, if you read the notes page, it walks you through that. I know that um, you, know, you have to come up with some policies at your agencies for that. So when I was at the city of Columbus, our policy was that if we're on a 12 foot, it's, it's sometimes it was similar to ODOT. So if we're, ODOT has 12 foot wide lanes most of the time. So our policy is if we, we don't want it to be any narrower than 10 feet. Okay, but then a lot of local agencies roadways, maybe they're only starting out with a, with a 10 foot lane to begin with. So then what? So you know, when I was at the city, sometimes we would uh, allow ourselves to uh, maybe only go one foot inside that neck it down to a nine foot lane or eight and a half or something like that. But definitely if we got the lane any narrower than eight feet you know, in that situation, we would just go ahead and close the lane. So we'd have to use a different typical application, one that involved a lane closure. So this is something that you uh, you have to think about. If it's a road that's carrying a lot of commercial traffic, you don't want it to be less than 10 feet. Hey, Ray, quick question. All right. Are the low speed charts available as a download like the design table is? Yeah, we're going to send out, um, are, are we sending out the PDFs? Yes, I will send out the PDFs of this as soon as the video finishes processing. So they would definitely be in your handout. Okay. So a shoulder taper, you know, we're not going to close a lane. We're only on the shoulder. So the length of a shoulder taper is one third the length of the merging taper. So again, when we're on the shoulder, if we're all, only on the shoulder, then we want to use the arrow panel for caution mode. So I already told my story about the what happens if you use an arrow. If, you, if you're on the shoulder and you use an arrow, you're causing a lot of confusion to the motorist. They don't know what you mean by the arrow. It doesn't mean they can't use the right lane or, or what. So you got to use the caution mode. So now let's talk about lane closures on two lane roads. 
So when we're working on a lane closure on a two-lane road, we need to discourage drivers from moving into the open lane because head-on collisions are possible. So with that, we, we have shorter tapers and we beef up the, the, the cones or drums on those shorter tapers. And uh, this encourages drivers to slow down because from a distance, if we set up the taper correctly, it looks like a wall of cones across their lane. So that makes them um, slow down. So here's what I mean. There's a, a rendering of a, of a two-way traffic taper. Again, a two-way traffic taper is, a, is another way of saying the flagging operation taper. So it's typically 50 to 100 feet long for two-lane flagging operations. So this is a lot different in length from a merging taper. If we looked at a 55 mile per hour multi-lane road and we looked at merging taper, we would see that that's over 600 feet long. But on a two-lane road, we're only using 50 feet to 100 feet. And so, of course, the difference is we have a flagger out there and a sign series out there. And in high speed, we don't just use, we don't want you to use just three signs. If we read the uh, typical application number 10, we'll see that in higher speeds, we want you to use four signs. There's a, a fourth sign that I showed you in, uh, last week. It says, be prepared to stop. So that's the fourth sign that we add. So here's a picture that was taken of a two-way traffic taper out in the field, but I must say I really don't like this uh, two-way traffic taper. Um, I think I see three cones here. I think I'd like to see a minimum of five. And uh, I don't like these uh, the old tar-covered cones. I prefer the the new cones that are very bright neon orange and have the two bands of retro reflectivity. So I'd want, you know, I don't know if that's exactly 50 feet or not. It might be a little short. So um, I don't give that this taper a grade of an A. Maybe give it a C minus. Plus they also have a big vehicle parked in the buffer space. That's not good. Remember a buffer space is supposed to be completely vacant. Here's a pretty important uh, thing that we got to talk about is, um, you know, when we're out there working on our two lane rural roads here in Ohio, we've got a lot of curves, don't we? Curves and other site distance restrictions. But when we're out there working in these situations, we don't want to surprise the motorists as they drive around the curve. Okay, so the question here is, is this taper <clears throat> properly located to be visible to approaching traffic? And of course, we have to assume that the traffic is driving at 55 miles per hour on a lot of our two lane rural roads. So is this taper properly located? And the answer is no. So where should it be? Okay, so the the taper should be before the curve. And so the flagger and all the signs and the taper need to be located before the curve. Here's a lane closure on a low volume two lane roadway. <clears throat> and um, I got to see this firsthand. Uh, down near my parents' house in Pike County, the Germany Road, County Road 66, uh, will close to one lane for some time. And so they use this typical application. So, but as you can see, we're not using flaggers, we're using signs and uh, we're using a yield ahead sign and then a yield sign. And also you can use, put the preferred speed limit 
through the work zone. So down on in the situation that was near my parents' house, I used 10 miles per hour. And the key here is that the motorist can see around the workspace to see if a car is coming. It doesn't work unless you uh, have that situation. And then we have a lane closure on a minor street. So, you know, sometimes the speeds and the volumes are so low that we don't have to get very involved in the work zone setup. Here we have just the, a, you know, one sign. It's got the symbol of the, the man with the shovel. And we got some cones. And of course, the work truck probably has his um, uh, uh, flashers on or the uh, the beacons, high intensity beacons turned on. So that's all you would need in this situation. So that's typical application number 18. And then we have intersection work. So we'll see um, that uh, typical applications 22 through 29 involve intersection work. And so when we're dealing with intersections, we usually don't have to mess around with uh, installing tapers, although sometimes we do. But in this particular situation, which involves a right lane closure on the far side of an intersection, we don't need to uh, have a taper here. Uh, that's because the intersection control um, provides enough guidance for the motorist. So if there, if someone is approaching the work zone in the right lane and they want to go straight through the intersection, they're obviously going to have to get over a lane. So we have our the advanced warning area signs say road work ahead, followed by through traffic merge left. So that's telling the motors they got to get over into the left lane. And then we see two regulatory signs. Remember, we talked about regulatory signs last week. This particular one says right lane must turn right. So if a motorist is going to stay in the right lane, then they need to turn right. But if they're going to go straight through, they obviously have to merge left. And then they're also having an arrow board here uh, to further guide the traffic over into the left lane. And then the signage from all the other directions is simply road work ahead. So if you're coming this way, you have a road work ahead sign or from the side streets, the only signs you have is road work ahead. So this picture might look like it has a, a whole lot of signs, but most of the signs are directed towards the northbound traffic. So each one of the typical applications from 22 to 29, they show a different uh, type of intersection. So the trick is to go through those, if you're working on an intersection, find the the one or two that looks most like the one you're in. Sometimes you have to borrow from one typical application or another to, uh, to piece together your work zone. Okay, so then we get to the actual work area, which consists of the buffer space and the workspace. Let's first talk about the buffer space. What is the buffer space? It's an area uh, that provides a recovery area for errant vehicles. So what's an errant vehicle? Well, you know, this day and age, we've talked about this, could be someone is not paying attention or under the influence, or it could be a medical reason. Um, unfortunately, about four or five years ago, we had a crash in a work zone up in Mahoning County where a motorist actually had a heart attack and then crashed into our work zone. And so there's obviously a lot of different reasons for errant vehicles to enter the workspace. And so that's all the more reason to provide a buffer space where we can handle these errant vehicles. So that's why this area is always empty. We don't want any vehicles or work vehicles or 
different pieces of equipment or materials here. So what it does is it provides the motorists a few extra seconds of time so that they can get things under control, you know, come to a stop or at least slow down and get back into the lane that they're supposed to be in. Or we can go above and beyond that and put an attenuator at the end of the buffer space for them to crash into the attenuator instead of any of the work trucks or people or workers in the workspace. So a buffer space is optional, but highly recommended. And so, you know, the word optional, when it become, when, when you see it in the text of the design of a work zone, it doesn't mean for you to uh, have the attitude of, well, it's optional, so I'm not going to do it. That's wrong, okay? So the word optional means that here are ways for you to make your work zone as safe as possible. And so a buffer space is definitely included in that definition. So um, if you're not going to have a buffer space, you better have a good reason not to provide it. And the length of the buffer space is re related to approach speed and other road conditions. Do we have a question, Victoria? No, there was just a comment that I'd shared out from one of our participants. It's actually from Illinois, um, okay. giving information from what they do in his state. Thanks, Ray. Okay. So let's take a look at a buffer space on a two-lane roadway. So if we're setting up a flagging operation, and in Ohio, we've got lots of high-speed two-lane roadways from 45 to 55. And so it's very important uh, anytime we're dealing with high speeds to go above and beyond any standards. We want to include the buffer space. And so the buffer space here is the space between the end of the taper and where the crew is actually working. So it needs to be completely vacant. And here we have a multi-lane roadway situation. It's a four-lane undivided roadway with a typical right lane closure. And here again, you see the buffer space is located between the, the end of the merging taper and before where the crew is actually working. And then here we have the typical application number 32, which is a, we're closing down half the roadway and using the shifting tapers for the northbound traffic, but a merging taper situation for southbound, but we can see the, the arrow pointing to the, the buffer space for the southbound direction. And then down here to the right is the buffer space in the northbound direction. So we have a buffer space in both directions. So stopping site distance is the, the length we use for our buffer space length. And so our, our table on page 17 has this information, but here we have it, you know, showing everything from 20 miles per hour up to 75 miles per hour. So if you're traveling at 35 miles per hour, for instance, then the length of the buffer space should be 250 feet. So what that means is, since it's called stopping site distance, that means that if someone is traveling at 35 miles per hour and they're distracted and then they arrive at the work zone and they've they've crashed through the merging taper and that's what woke them out of their trance, then it's going to take them about 250 feet to come to a stop because they have to react, which takes a little bit of time. And then, uh, you know, their, their reaction includes uh, a gasp and a, and then their foot has to reach the brake pedal and the, the brake pedal has to go all the way to the floor and, uh, you know, the inner mechanisms of the braking system have to take place and, and then the wheels come to a stop and there's probably a skid and all of this, 
you know, it takes time, and of course, time means distance because they're they are a body in motion. They're traveling at that speed limit for the first second or first second and a half. You know, if someone is traveling at 60 miles per hour, that means they are traveling at a rate of, if you do the math, that's 88 feet per second. So if they're traveling at 60 and, you know, it takes them a second to come to a, to depress the, to react and depress the brake pedal, they've gone 88 feet uh, beyond from where they started uh, before they actually start to decelerate. So if you look over on the right, hand side of this table and look at 60 miles per hour, you'll see that the buffer space is 570 feet. Uh, so that's quite a difference from uh, 35, isn't it? And then at 55, it's almost 500 feet. So uh, that's why the buffer space is longer than you probably thought it should be, is because we have to take into account the motorist that is surprised by the situation. So that was the buffer space, and then we have our, then we finally arrive to the actual workspace where the work is taking place. So in this space, we have the workers, we've got equipment, materials, and if you're being extra safe, you had the attenuator at the beginning of the workspace and at the end of the buffer space. Here's where we want to minimize any conflicts. So. This is where we really need to focus on providing the proper temporary traffic control devices to provide a, a visible travel path to the motorist and to do a good job of separating the traffic space from the workspace. And then here we have the actual traffic space on the two lane road. So this is where all the motorists are driving by the workspace. So in the traffic space, you know, this is the space reserved for the public to pass our um, our workspace safely in the open lane. Then we have our termination area. So this is the end of the work zone where traffic resumes its normal driving path. And it may contain a downstream taper, which is 100 foot minimum per lane reopened. And a lot of times uh, the typical application calls out for a end road work sign which is about 500 feet past the last device. And so those are optional. You know, you can, a lot of work zones I see, they don't have the end road work sign, but you know, most ODOT projects do. But another one that should always have an end road work sign is your flagging operation. So I definitely wanna use that in a flagging operation. That way the motorists know that there's no more people that they have to worry about, like the flagger. So it's just a very short taper created with cones and that lets the, the motorist visually see that it's the end of the workspace and they can get back to driving normally. So another thing that we have to uh, think about in the design of our work zone is how to space our channelizing devices properly, either our cones or our drums. And uh, there's a table on your handout, the middle table, and it shows us uh, the same information. So on the taper of multi-lane roadways, the maximum spacing of our cones is one times the speed limit in feet. And on two lane roadways, the maximum spacing is 20 feet. And this is just, those two are just in the taper. So the taper on a multi-lane roadway, the cones can be one times the speed limit in feet apart. And then on a flagging operation, we want our cones to be closer together for the two lane road. And that's a maximum of 20 feet. And then on the tangent section of your work zones throughout the buffer space and workspace on either type of roadway, the maximum spacing is two times the speed limit in feet. So that's maximum spacing. You can put them side by side if you want, that's fine. But the maximum spacing 
is what you see here. So you want to think about it, you know, what are you most comfortable with? And so if you're not comfortable with the, uh, the maximum spacing, then feel free to put your cones closer together. So here's just a drawing of uh, the different spacings uh, for the different parts of the work zone. Okay, so if we talked about a flagging operation, the maximum spacing is 20 feet apart in a taper. So if you think about it, if you're going to use a 100 foot long taper, that means you're going to have six cones in that taper. So when we're driving around and inspecting flagging operations, I don't care how long the taper is, if it's 50 or 100, we want a minimum of six cones in there. All right, that should clear it up for you. So this creates the appearance of a wall to approaching traffic from a distance. Um, and so uh, that encourages the traffic to slow down or come to a stop. And of course, that's in conjunction with all of your other signs out there and the flagger. Okay, so, you know, we have different types of residential streets. We have the urban residential streets. So what does that consist of? Mostly these urban residential streets are straight roads, evenly spaced blocks. You know, you're thinking about, if you're familiar, like the, the near east side of Columbus, near, you know, very close to downtown. So in these situations, you, you usually have good sight distance, low volume, and low speed. So for these types of streets, maybe you only need a single warning sign uh, you can park your work truck in a closed lane with your flashing beacons turned on. Maybe you want to have a flagger out there just to, maybe just one flagger to help guide traffic to bring more visibility to your workspace. And so um, it's best if you use a stop slow paddle and uh, have whoever's doing that to have uh, some training in how to flag properly, which we will get to that in a couple weeks. Then we have our suburban residential streets that are a little bit different from uh, the urban residential streets. These are, um, they usually have wider streets, a little bit higher speeds. They're not 25, they're usually 35 to 45. They have curves and um, more limited sight distances. And there are always two-way traffic, unlike urban, you know, a lot of urban residential streets are one way. So if we're dealing with a situation that has a reduced sight distance, we want to make sure that your devices are seen. So we have to take these curves and hills into account. So we may need to provide longer tapers to close the lane and maybe even have advanced flaggers before the obstruction. Then we have our central business district. So, you know, downtown Columbus, downtown Cleveland, these situations of, um, they're usually low speed, 25 miles per hour, but there are some cities in Ohio where, you know, maybe they don't have a clear cut downtown. And so um, those streets, uh, some of them actually have 45 mile per hour streets in those areas. But, you know, either way, you've got higher traffic volumes, you have intersections, on street parking, alleys, multiple driveways, uh, transit, pedestrians. Of course, a lot of pedestrians you got to think about. Another thing you have is unfamiliar drivers. And so um, they're confused already, let alone uh, stumbling up, up on your work zone that day. So um, sometimes you have one-way streets and multiple lane one-way streets. And of course, short blocks. So they have less room to install your work zone. So sometimes uh, your devices cannot be visible over parked cars, so you might want to consider removing parking uh, in those areas for that day. And uh, you might be able to uh, mount your signs on existing posts, uh, but sometimes uh, you have to have your proper permits to do that. Like I said, when I was at the city, we installed our signs mounted to drums, for instance. Uh, that really helped us out. That we used the drums in the, the parking areas that we removed. 
So I know I'm running out of time here today, but um, you know, also central business district, your uh, the proper length of a taper may not fit because your your blocks are too close or too short. So you, you, you we always use drums in downtown Columbus. That was our policy. We didn't use cones in downtown Columbus. Uh, sometimes we would also use uh, barricades, and so uh, people, you know, pedestrians and bicyclists respect drums more than uh, they do the cones. So we always want to remember the basics of closures, placing your warning signs well in advance, uh, use the proper length of taper, and uh, always provide a buffer space uh, to enhance the safety. So. Uh, Anyway, this, I guess, is a good place to leave off. This table here just reiterates uh, the length of our five different types of tapers for different situations. Right. There's one quick question. All right. Um, came in the question box, and I want to be respectful of people's times if they need to go. Um, you know, we understand that. But the question is, we don't post reduced speed limits in our high-speed work zones. We just rely on the slow-down move-over law. Should we post a reduced speed limit? Well, that it would enhance the safety, um, definitely, just providing more information to the motorist. As, uh, you know, at, at ODOT, our longer-term projects, uh, you know, like more than three days, we always do that. But um, um, you know, that's, uh, we actually have our, our work zone guru at ODOT is, uh, Dwayne Soisson. And, um, you know, that's something that you could run by him of how you could properly do that. I know you can do the advisory speed plaque, for instance, to place on post mounted signs. I don't know how you would do that with the uh, portable signs. So, um, that's something to oh. consider as well. Yeah, we'll send out Dwayne's contact information when we send out a link to this recording. So, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ray, for the great presentation. All right. So this is where we're going to begin, uh, wrap up that last slide or two in part in lesson three. And in lesson four, we'll get down to looking at some work zone traffic control layouts and uh, generate some discussion uh, on that. Next week. So we'll see you next right. week. Everyone take care. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.